Have you seen the new Batgirl pics of Brendan Fraser's Firefly? He looks sort of like Ratcatcher meets the Riddler. What do you think? Thanks for answering my email, Kimberly Bronte. Uh, I have seen them, Andrew. I've seen these pictures. I'll put them on the screen. Here they are right here. I think I like the way he looks. He does look a little bit like Ratcatcher. Uh, you're not wrong, but I really enjoy this. I've seen the behind the scenes stuff. I don't know if you have Andrew of Brendan Fraser walking out of an explosion of a building on fire. The fire truck scene with Batgirl chasing him. It all looks like a lot of fun. I, you know, we talk about this on this channel a lot. This Batgirl movie is one that I am uh, psyching myself up for more and more. Probably not good uh, good of me to do that. Probably it's an HBO Max show or uh, movie. So we'll see. But I think this looks actually really cool. I think it is it is a down-to-earth, grounded-looking uh, Firefly, I guess. But it, it seems cool, and it seems like it's working, and it fits with the vibe, especially of the vibe and aesthetic of the costume we saw that Batgirl's going to have. So I'm all in on this. I think it looks great. I thought the same thing, Kimberly, when I saw this for the first time. Yeah, he's got that old uh, World War II era kind of radiation helmet going on there. It's very Ratcatcher-esque. Uh, but I like the idea of Firefly like hiding his face because his face is all messed up because he's been in way too many fires. Uh, one fire is one fire too many. So I like the idea that he is sort of hiding what he looks like uh, and saving it for a big kind of Anakin Skywalker-esque reveal at some point in the movie. I don't think we've gotten pics of Brendan Fraser's face yet, have we? Uh, there has been some behind the scenes stuff that we have seen. Yes. And he just looks like Brendan Fraser. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but that might've been, I don't know if that is how he's going to look in the final product or not, but I think it is. So I think it's just going to be his face from what I can tell. So I don't, I don't know. Well, I've been telling you from day one, this would be a lot better movie if it was a secret George of the jungle sequel. And so far I see no proof that it isn't. It's not, you know, it, Brendan Fraser's first uh, few movies were Encino Man, George of the Jungle, and what was his other one? And, yeah, and, well, Dudley do But his first two movies, he didn't even speak. He just played the unspeaking, I mean, school tie shirt, but, or school, yeah, school, sure. But uh, George of the Jungle and Encino Man, they were like, we, he's got something here. But now he's like the most beloved actor uh, of them all. Him and Keanu Reeves, who was voicing Batman in the Super Pets uh, cartoon movie, are the two <laughs> most beloved actors ever and both of them grew up in toronto area ontario brendan fraser grew up in toronto i don't know but he wore a leaf jersey on saturday Night live <laughs> in the late 90s so i'm just gonna go with it i'm excited for batgirl i think it's gonna be a lot of fun i think there's a reason why michael keaton showed up why brendan brendan fraser i mean you know maybe he just wants to do it he's in doom patrol obviously maybe this is something that he wanted to do i think the script might have something to be honest i i'm very intrigued to see the first trailer. I'm not intrigued to see the, the YouTube comments for the first trailer, but Ugh. I'm intrigued to see the first trailer. I am very excited for this whole, just the whole thing about it. Like, first of all, a Batgirl movie is exciting. And then to add to it, you have this villain who's like, the hopes of seeing him anywhere else were pretty, like, it was slim. Like, we were never going to get, Firefly is going to be the villain in Christopher Nolan's fourth movie. Like, that was never going to be a thing. So to finally see Firefly, a guy like Firefly, who's C-list Batman villain, maybe, pop up in this and to finally get like a big screen version of him, even though it is HBO Max, and have him still flying around Gotham and to top it all off, you've got Keaton. That sounds to me like this is a special movie. This really feels like a special movie. And it feels like it's our first sort of, how do I put this? Like our first movie that's acknowledging the wider world of Gotham. I think DC, I think you're right. And DC's got something on their hands with these lesser characters. We saw with Peacemaker, Suicide Squad. They mm -hmm. say, When you give it to the right combination of writers, directors, and whatnot, obviously James Gunn did it all for Peacemaker. But when you give it to people who care, they can utilize these C-list characters and and elevate them to a list like peacemaker is now on the top of people's list for favorite superhero right like that's that's not easy to achieve especially a character like that but they were able to make that happen because of a, a writer director who cared and had a passion for it <laughs> and a lot of these dealers i mean marvel the whole mar mcu was built on b-list 
superheroes. Let's be honest, right? Like mm -hmm. who I, you know, the Hulk maybe during the time now things have changed, obviously, but Iron Man was a B lister for sh like he is the quintessential B list superhero who has elevated himself to probably above A list now. You know, it was like Spider Man, Batman were top tier, and then. Uh, who else did they, you know, Thor B C list? Maybe he was around there. He's Thor, oh, Captain but, uh, America. Like no, yeah. no kids in 1995 were having Captain America parties. Like it wasn't. No, happening. no, I never cared for Captain America, and then Winter Soldier blew my mind. So <laughs> I think, I think the the one thing too is for DC is when you use these lesser characters, you have a lot more free range too, because all of a sudden people don't know too much about them, they don't care too much about them, and you throw them in, and it. It's really it's an exciting time to be a comic book movie fan. It's an exciting time to be a DC fan because the MCU has got their feet firmly planted on what they do. And I think DC has now figured out what they're going to do. We're going to talk about it a little bit later on the show, but they're very like secure now on what their mission is, even though it might not make any sense. But they're <laughs> they seem pretty secure. And I think using these mid tier, lower tier villains, heroes is brilliant. Even Batgirl, Batgirl's you know, B list. She's probably up there with not as she's probably up there. Like C she's higher than C I'd go B with Iron Man prior to the MCU. She was up there. She was another character. Everyone knew and respected sidekick. I think using her, I think DC using her as their Batman and Batman being like her mentor. And then leading up to what Scotty Hawk likes to say on this channel to the Gotham Knights. I think that's the way you do this. Yeah. over here because now you have the batman the batman has come out it's huge it's the reeves verse right reeves is going to create a whole universe around batman and uh, i was thinking actually this weekend i was thinking you know batman spider-man and x-men don't need to be part of bigger universes no because they they're don't. like their universes are already so rich like they have and i and, and when matt reeves said it i didn't think anything of it then thinking back on the Reeves verse and his, I'm like, no, no, Batman is the MC. Like, it's its own MCU. You've got everything you need within there that you can keep growing and expanding. So I think the DCEU, whatever that means, but the Batgirl world that it's living in makes sense to be separate from this one. Use her as like your base and then everything can grow around it because, you know, the Batman stuff over there and leave this here. And, and I, I think the future is so bright and I really, really hope this movie uh, pans out and is a hit. Oh, I hope so. I hope it builds that pocket of the DCEU in a fun way. And it comes at it in that Marvel way where it's like, we're going to introduce you to this pocket, but not through the all-star that you're familiar with. We're going to introduce you through the Iron Man character, you know, through the mm -hmm. character who's like not 100%. Like there are, I would say maybe, unless you're like crazy sweaty into DC, there's a good chance most people don't know that that girl is a separate entity from Batwoman, that they're two people, mm -hmm. two different, completely different characters. Uh, and it's just be, it's like, it's not their fault. It's not like, Oh, they're not real fans. It's just those two characters just don't get all the love they deserve. I mean, Batwoman's got a show uh, that I haven't seen yet. Cause I'm still working my way through those DC shows. There's a lot of them, uh, but there's not a whole lot of spotlight shined on those characters especially in the recent uh -huh. years like when's the last time anybody saw bat girl on screen 1966 right uh batman and robin batman and robin right sorry yeah. i totally forgot about her so so and she wasn't even wearing purple so it's like was no. she even a really bat girl um that's going to change i hope i hope we get to a point in two years from now that that movie is so well received that the same way all our moms know who iron man is all our moms are going to know, yeah, Batgirl is one person and Batwoman is another person. And they both do their own thing in Gotham City. I want to live in that world because that means we have explored depths of Gotham that we've never gotten to see before. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Gotham is so rich with every aspect of it. And I'm excited to see what they're bringing forward. And I'm hoping that these, these mid-level tiers on DC can be pushed up the ranks like Marvel did such a fantastic job. All it takes is, you know... With Iron Man, I don't know who wrote the Iron Man, the first Iron Man, I apologize, but John Favreau was obviously in there and he loved it. And Kevin Feige was so hard in there, right? And he loved it. And Feige had a goal, a game plan. But what you needed to get to that game plan was a starting off point, And that first movie had to hit. And Iron Man, the 
irony of Iron Man, I mm-hmm. should say, is it came out the exact same year as The Dark Knight. And it was so horribly overshadowed by The Dark Knight that I remember talking to friends about the movies. I'd be like, and I would, Andrew, of all the people, would be me. And I'd be the one arguing, like, but Iron Man was fantastic. Because everyone's like, Dark Knight's the greatest movie ever. I'm like, yeah, but Iron Man was also, fa-. like, it was fantastic. And, you know, I wasn't taking anything away from The Dark Knight because that's a fantastic movie. But Iron Man was a more fantastic superhero movie and it was iron man of all characters it didn't, exactly. it didn't it didn't need to rest on the joker or heath ledger's performance it had robert downey jr knocking it out of the ballpark but it was iron man like it was like i watched that cartoon in the 90s sure and i had a couple comics from the early 90s but it, it was iron man like no one cared about iron man and you know he, you know when you got an Iron Man comic, I was like, yeah, I just grabbed this because you know whatever. But, but, but this movie was fantastic and got overshadowed by the Dark Knight. And the and what I always find funny is that was like the turning point in superhero movies where somehow, you know, the dark and gritty stuff kind of went so- to the side, and MCU was like, no, we're gonna bring back the hope of superhero movies and color and all that stuff. And it, but it was weird that like. But it was almost like this peak of like Dark Knight was the peak of like this the, because Batman begins to me like ruin movies for a long time because everything was like <laughs> it's got to be grounded in reality. It's like no, and then Iron Man was the one that kind of broke away from that mold. It's like, but even Iron Man one was still somewhat grounded in reality it, to a degree, like an Iron Man reality. Like it still had to live with an Iron Man. And then when Thor showed up, they were like, "All bets are off." Yeah, to a degree, <laughs> like, like Iron, Iron Man was never afraid to have a vivid color palette. And it was never no. afraid to like inject fun into every possible nook and cranny you could find. And I mean, you talk about like, yeah, what a summer that was, right? From May to July, we had those two completely disparate movies. Uh, and but like the overshadowing, you're right. That I totally forgot how much Iron Man, because back then it was there was no MCU yet. So it's not like was everybody nothing. was like, yeah. No one even no one even knew to stay for an end credit scene at that point. No, that was just the rumor. People were like, I think there's a scene. We, and I mean, we can't, uh, like, I, I can't overstate this enough. Yes, you got Heath Ledger's Joker, arguably one of the best Jokers that's ever been shown to us. But on the flip side of that, you got Jeff Bridges coming along, giving us a comic book character that people cared about and knew about even less than Iron Man. And to this day, James, he is still in my top five Marvel villains. Really? Yeah. The, I, he was a good. He was actually a really good villain. The problem with that villain is every villain in Marvel after that was this, that villain. That was <laughs> that was the problem. Was, Mar, but this is the thing when we talk about the Batverse anyway. Is like, and Batgirl can utilize it. Is Batman and Spider Man have the best villains of all the comic book characters mm-hmm. ever. And the Marvel, other than that, like Marvel's got a couple other ones, obviously Dr. Doom and stuff like that. But like, there's not, you know, I, I couldn't name you an Ant-Man villain. <laughs> Do you know? I mean, Superman has Lex Luthor, but that's a you know, brainiac. So yeah, utilize it. Make Batgirl good. Just make Batgirl good. If that's all we're asking, make it good. For me, it looks like it's going to be good. Do you? So we talk on this channel on Tuesdays about superheroes. Scotty Hot really wants this movie to be like a hard, like an R-rated, almost dark, gritty, bloody. How do you feel? How would you like the tone of this Batgirl movie to go? Oof. No, I don't want it to be R-rated. Um, I I don't know how old Batgirl is supposed to be. I don't know if she's like eighteen or if she's you know thirty. Uh, like how how literal are we talking when we say the word Batgirl? I'm hoping she's in her twenties. 20s sounds right to me. Yeah. Um, That's like, right. Uh, like to see. like how, she, how old she was basically in the Adam West show. Like yeah. She seemed like she was early 20s, you know, just out of college, whatever. Um, I don't mind if it's dark because I feel like Gotham should be dark. Um, but I don't no, I don't want like a super brooding R-rated. I don't want this to feel like the Batman. Uh, I'd much rather it feel a bit more heightened, a bit less realistic because the DCEU is like that. And it has kind of made its mark being about things that are a little off kilter from humanity. Like it's it's about people who are basically gods. So even though she doesn't have powers and Firefly doesn't have powers, I, I'd rather see it be a heightened, pulpy, comic booky kind of thing where we see just lots of Gotham world building. That's what I want to see. 
lots of the world building of, of uh, you know, just walking down the street and, and seeing like graffiti that says like Two-Face rules. You know, I just want stuff that shows us that this is a rich, thick Gotham and we are just dipping our finger in the milkshake. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know how I feel about the rating. I love Peacemaker. And I don't think it would be the same R as Peacemaker. And I, I don't know what an R really means other than blood and swearing and maybe some nudity. And we're not going to get nudity in, in a superhero movie. Well, I shouldn't say that. We're not going to get nudity in a a uh, family character. Peacemaker, you're going to get all you want. Suicide Squad, mm-hmm. sure. But like in the Batman, Superman, Spider-Man, that kind of, you're not going to get nudity. Blood, maybe. And swearing every once in a while. But... You know, I, I loved Logan, but there was a few times when they threw out the F-bomb and I got taken out of it a little bit. because I was like, yeah, like just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah. And and sometimes I find um, sometimes I find when actors are swearing, it doesn't always feel as natural as it should, especially in a character that has never done that before. Like in, in first class when he swears. Perfect. Oh, it was yeah. perfect. But and, and look, not all the. I'm not saying every time he uses the f bomb in, in Logan, but there was one. There was definitely one that I remember watching in the theater, being like, "Nah, you just did that because you could, not because you needed to." And you know, although Logan, you know, was a great movie, and I needed, the, I think the blood in that one was necessary because that's what you got to do it. And so I'm not sure how I feel about Batgirl right now. I think you know we don't have a ton of strong female superheroes at the moment, right? We're building up uh, Black Widow's sister, kind of. Right. And Kate Bishop's coming. And so I just think, you know, we talked about this with Batman is like, there's no Batman movie for kids anymore. They got to stick to like the cartoons when, like, you know, maybe we need to give something to the kids a little bit, but at the same time, I want to be selfish and give me rated R. All right, let's move <laughs> on. 